All right. I love that worship. Uh, I, what is that? 139th Psalm. Your head's been behind and before. Kind of like these songs we're singing. You laid your hands upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. God is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your presence? If I send to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there also. Is God amazing? I mean, it's just like he's got us. He's got us covered. I was, um, Jacob called a couple weeks ago. He wanted me to speak on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're going through, um, you guys are going through, but I've been watching the videos, about being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he wanted me to speak on the gifts. I want to start by just, I love the word. You guys know that up here. I like quoting the word. I'm going to do a lot of that today, hopefully. If I don't stumble through it, it's not. People say I have a gift for it, but I, in my opinion, I kind of work hard at it. But I love it. It's, it's more than worth it. So I'm going to look at the 19th Psalm. This is the word I'm going to bring to you, is, is starting with the 19th Psalm. It says, the heavens declare your glory, O Lord, the firmament, the earth, shows forth your handiwork. Day and the day it utters speech, night and the night it reveals knowledge. There is no language, no speech where your voice is not heard. Your lines have gone out through all the earth, your words to the end of the world. And in them you've established a tabernacle for your son. It's like a bridegroom coming forth from his chamber, running like a strong man to run the race set before him. That's the first half of it. See, then the second half goes something like that. The law of the Lord is perfect. Let me get this right here. See, that's not easy to do. Let me get in here. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord are sure, making wise and simple. The statutes of the Lord are righteous, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. And the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgments of the Lord, they are righteous and true altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, much fine gold, and sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there's great reward. Who could understand his errors? Cleanse me, Lord, of secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I'll be blameless of innocent great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your eyes, O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. That's a prayer I say like every morning when I go to work. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your eyes, O Lord. But what's unique about that psalm is the first half, until, you know, where I stopped, kind of got lost. It's about the creation. The second half is about the word. And you can just, David wrote this psalm, and they think he was probably when he was young, he wrote this, when he was, like, taking care of sheep in the fields. Because it's, you know, it's about the sun. The circuit is from one end of heaven to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. You know, they think the eighth psalm where he says, you know, when I consider the moon and the stars, the work of your hands, what is man that you are mindful of him? They think that was his nighttime song. This was his daytime song, the 19th psalm. But I, I love the balance of it about the creation and then the word. Because basically, you know, when Jesus came, the word was made flesh. We, when I look at my Bible... I'm kind of turning into my Bible. <laughs> you know, it's my story, but it's his glory. And I think that's true with every one of us. When I, when I sing these songs, I go, Lord, you've had to be in behind and before you laid your hands upon me. It's not the song. It's not the Bible. It's my story. It's me. And this happens on a lot of different levels. But I want my story to be his glory. That's going to sound very arrogant, but I believe I'm a gift from God. But I also believe every one of us are a gift from God. Every person on this planet is a gift from God. Most of us just don't know it. You start spending a lot of time in the Word, and you start spending a lot of time in prayer, and you start spending a lot of time in fasting, and you start getting closer to God, you realize that I belong to Him. I'm his handiwork. God created me. He fashioned me. He's given me the gifts. He's given me a mind that will spend the time memorizing scripture, 
People call it a gift, but he's made me that way. My wife, you know, she's got a gift for administration. But God put her in a family with seven little brothers and sisters. She learned how to administrate at a very young age. <laughs> God did that in her long before she became a Christian. We all have gifts in us. Now, when you look at the Bible, we get, you know, a picture of different gifts. And they're very good. It's interesting, as I've been studying this, I've learned some come from the Father, some come from the Son, and from, some come from the Holy Spirit. The gifts, like for me, my memorization and Nancy's anointing for administration, that's really from God. We were created with those. We were created with those. Let me... Um, I think the key to our gifting is the cross. And it's not just the cross that Jesus went to. It's a cross that he asks us to carry. It's a cross he says, take up your cross and follow after me. See, the key to the gifts that are in us is our willingness to give. I'm becoming more and more convinced that giving is living. If you really want to live, give. The more you give, the more you're going to live. It's really simple. There's one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. Another one I've put to memory, and I'm going to try to quote it in a minute, is in Philippians chapter 2. It's the first 10 chapters, first 10 verses of Philippians chapter 2. It's a song, part of it is a song, it's called the kenosis, which is basically the pouring out of Jesus. God giving up everything to become a man. Pour it out for us. I learned this past week that some think that song wasn't written by Paul, even though he put it in Philippians. We know Philippians was written by Paul. But it was written by the early church, the first Christians. And I've been thinking about it, praying about it. It might have been what Paul and Silas were singing that night in jail when the prison doors opened and chains fell off. You know? And it goes something like this. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one mind, of one accord. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but with loneliness of mind, let each esteem others as better than themselves. Let each of you have this mind that was also in Christ Jesus, who although he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. But he emptied himself, he poured himself out, and made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bonsoir, or the form of a man, and, and, and coming to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And for this reason, God has highly exalted him and given him the name above every other name, that the name of Jesus Christ, every knee on heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's a beautiful passage. Because I've memorized it, I know I messed it up pretty bad. <laughs> but trust me, it's a powerful thought, something to write on your heart. Because as we learn to pour ourselves out, a little bit later, Paul says, and even if I'm being poured out as an offering, I never made the connection until, like, I think it was just last night, that we are to be poured out. God wants to pour us out. Each and every one of us are a gift to our families, our friends, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, to all those around us. And when we take on that servant heart, it's become servant leadership. We serve those around us. We have gifts. We have all kinds of gifts. Some are so simple to use, like the gift of encouragement. We can encourage pretty much anybody. And if we do it with a heart of love, it becomes powerful. There's another passage in Philippians that I learned a long time ago, and it's in Philippians chapter 3. And it's something Paul said that I kind of related to, and this is one of the first passages I started memorizing, a couple of psalms I did earlier as a kid. But, and it's basically, what things were gained to me, these I counted lost for Christ. In fact, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and counted all his rubbish that it might gain Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but having that righteousness which comes from faith in Christ, that righteousness which is from God by faith, that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. 
Not that I've already attained, but I press on, that I might lay hold of everything for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not consider myself to have already apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward and pressing toward that which is ahead, I press toward the mark of the upper calling of God in Christ Jesus. I messed that one up a little bit too, but I got the main thought across. When I started to memorize that, I was at a time of my life where I just had a major loss. When we moved out here, um, I was going to grad school, graduate school. I came here to go to ODU, a nurse anesthetist program. And it's a 28-month program. We sold everything. We moved out here, cashed out about half of my retirement. And um, 24 months into this 28-month program, they failed me out of the program. It devastated me. Spent a whole lot of money, took a year off from work, all kinds of stuff, and I thought I was failed out unjustly. I, I thought, you know, this is wrong. I was, lo- I was looking for lawyers, all kinds of things about it. And I finally, you know, they said, well, you, you, you can't sue the school for failing you. You know, it just doesn't work that way. So, you know, I remember taking, going to church one day and just going up to the prayer line, so, you know, with like this handful of pieces. God, this is, this is my life. I don't know what to do with it. What things were gained for me? These are lost. I count it all as lost. I give it up for you. And after that, I started really memorizing scriptures from that loss. That loss turned out to be one of the greatest gains in my life. Another one that kind of happened along the same, same lines was when I was um, in 1984, my father died. I wasn't close to my father. It was in, you know, in November of 84. He lived in New York. I lived in Arizona all my life, pretty much, since I was like six years old, five years old. He called and wanted to move home. It's like, well, your home's New York, mine's Arizona. I'm not providing a home for you. I mean, <laughs> I grew up out here. Where were you when I wanted a dad? You know, I, I had a lot of bitterness and anger in my heart. And um, he died alone. He moved to Tucson to be close by, and, um, but that's about as close as he got to me. But as 1985 came around, and my mother was already dead, and I have no aunts, uncles, grandparents, really no other family except for a brother who was in the Philippines in the Air Force. So 1985, because of that situation, I started to pray and seek God like I never had before. And I wasn't a Christian at that time. I had long hair. I was getting high. I was drinking a lot. I was just, um, I was lost, very lost. I was a mess, you know. I, I was suicidal. I mean, it's like, I don't want to live. I mean, I don't, it's like big identity crisis, like abandonment issues, all kinds of stuff in me. Um, so anyways, during that time, I started worshiping God, even though I wasn't in a church, even though I wasn't in fellowship with any Christians. And the only Christian song I know, this is going to sound kind of funny, a lot of you guys have heard these stories before, those that have known me for a long time, is Kumbaya. Seriously. So I'm in the morning, at 4 o'clock in the morning, singing Kumbaya, but except I've heard the words are actually, come by here, is what it means. So I'm singing, come by here, Lord, come by here. And at that time, I'd also been praying the Our Father who art in heaven. That's the only prayer I knew. And I was in a time and a season in my life where I was genuinely seeking God with all my heart because I was desperate. I was a mess. And as I was singing that song one night, I, I had a job in a cable plant, and I had a lot of liberty to where I could walk around at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I smoked, and I would go sit outside and drink coffee and smoke and watch the sunrise and pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And, and, go sing that song. And as I was singing it one night, all of a sudden I felt like this comforter laid across me, like a big blanket. And what I felt was the presence of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know it at the time. What I felt at the time, what I thought, what I still believe, is just the love of God. It's like in that moment I knew God was real. I knew that he knew me and that he existed. There was just this warm sense of love and comfort. And I'm weeping, you know, here I am, this long-haired, drug-smoking hippie, just weeping from the power of God. And I was living with my wife at that time, 
And at that time, we were just living together, weren't even married. And um, at the end of 85, she asked me, well, what do you want for Christmas? And I told her, well, it's um, Jesus' birthday. I want to give my life to Jesus. So I want to get baptized. I hadn't been in the church. So my wife and her gift of administration came back a couple days later saying, okay, Pete, on January 8th, you have an appointment to get baptized at Gospel Echoes Bible Church. <laughs> and on January 8th, 1986, I walked into Gospel Echoes Bible Church and got baptized. Not knowing anybody. I've never met the pastor before. They did send this packet out with all these questions, and you, and you fill it out, and I did that. And the pastor was asking me, well, do you know anybody here? I go, and Nancy was sitting there, going, and I was, my knees were shaking, I was like terrified. I know her. <laughs> that was it. I got baptized. Now, the word baptism actually means immersion. Now, we all take it, when we think of baptism, we think of people getting immersed in the water, and rightfully so. But that's really a symbol of something going on deeper. And since then, I've come to realize that, in a sense, that encounter with the Holy Spirit a year before or so was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was immersed in God. Something changed in my life. And that day, I got baptized in water. I started going to Gospel Echoes Bible Church on Wednesday nights, Sunday nights, Sunday mornings. Started going on missions trips. I got immersed into the body of Christ, and I've been going to church ever since. I look at it as being immersed into Jesus. You know, I was baptized. In, you get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, I think we get immersed, hopefully, in an awareness of God, in the body of Christ, and in the Holy Spirit. Now, as I said earlier, um, all of us have these messes in our life. At that point, I, you know, I, th I think things in the creation kind of represent things in the natural. That's why I was talking about the 19th Psalm. And like that comforter that was laid over me was a very soft comforter. But what my life looked like wasn't like a very soft comforter at that time. I got this, we had an international student living with us just recently that bought my dog a present. This little cloth about this big. And I thought, well, that's stupid. You know, what's a dog going to do with a cloth? Well, he loves it. This is his cloth. It's his comforter. <laughs> Pretty wild, huh? But this is also my life. <laughs> this is how I feel some days. That's how I was that day when I needed God. I've had a couple people pray for me over the past week, and one, not knowing about this comforter, not knowing I was thinking about bringing this, and they said, you know, the Holy Spirit shines through the holes in your soul. Two people have told me that same thing in different places. We all have these holes in our lives. There's people in here can probably relate to this, and you feel like this. And when you give it to God... This mess becomes your biggest gift. Now, we can talk about the gifts of teaching and the gifts of encouragement and the gifts of prophecy and the gifts of tongue, fasting. That's all good stuff. But your pain and the trauma that we all go through, that is our biggest treasure. If we give it back to God. If we try to keep it and fix it ourselves, it will destroy us. It will destroy us. And a lot of people try that. And they're doing all kinds of crazy things out there trying to fix this. When the only thing that can fix it is God. And he'll fill every hole with his glory. And his light will shine through every hole if you give it to God. That is a gift that we want, that I want. So that's my treasure. There's something interesting. Talk a little bit about giving because each one of us are unique. My dog, he loves this thing. And what I do with it is I get it and I just rub my hands on it. And I toss it down to him. And he grabs it with his paws and he starts sticking his nose in it. 
and he just sniffs it. He just sniffs it. He loves it. He just sniffs it. That is what God does with us when we give this to him. What I rub on it is the oil off of my hands. What God rubs on it is the anointing, the presence of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the scent of God. But Paul says in um, Corinthians, in chapter 2, of, somewhere in there, I think it's about verse 13 or 14, he says, we are the fragrance of Christ unto God. When we start giving everything to God, when we give out of love, whatever it is, we are the fragrance of Jesus Christ unto God. It's like how sweet it is. When you think about the Old Testament, he's always on burnt offerings because they're like a sweet aroma, a sweet savor to him. And in the New Testament, the cross in our lives, which we see as sacrifice and pain and, and the step of faith that's necessary to give something hard. It's a treasure. It's a sweet fragrance to God. And it's also a sweet fragrance to those around us. People see it. They sense it. They sense the love of it. It becomes something very precious, something special to them. Let me um, get back on track here. <laughs> My... Um, where am I? Oh, the other thing I was going to mention about these cloths, about my dog's sense of smell. I love to read. You know, I love the word. That's my favorite book. This is my story, and hopefully his glory, you know. But I read a lot of different books. I just, I love to read. And, and just, like, nonfiction, stuff that I can learn. There's a book out there called An Immense World right now, which I don't know if anybody's heard of it. It's kind of a heavy read. It's kind of a weird book. And what it is, is about all the things in the world that we don't see or hear or smell or know about. Now, like my dog, he loves us because he smells something in it that I don't smell. You know, he sees things I don't see. Animals all around us have, you know, like elephants. I didn't realize this until I started reading this book. Have an incredible sense of smell, much, much stronger than a dog's sense of smell. And it kind of makes sense when you think about a trunk, a huge nose that they have. You know, and they, they smell everything. But what was interesting about this, they're talking about the dog's sense of smell. We actually have more receptors for different aromas, different fragrances, different scents in our noses than dogs have in theirs. It's kind of weird, kind of amazing. They have like maybe 10 different kinds of receptors. But what happens with those 10 different kinds of receptors is they might get a little on this one, a little bit on that one. And it's almost like, think of 10 numbers. How many different numbers can you come up with, like, with, with the 10 digits we have? It's almost like an infinite number of numbers. You know, what, a billion or a trillion or so, close to a trillion? And dogs, it's almost like a phone number. They get a different combination, and they recognize that scent. Where I'm going with this is that's how our gift mixes are. Every one of us have different gifts. We're all unique. We're all special. No two of us have the same gift mix. Some of us might be great encouragers. Some of us might have a great gift of teaching. Some of us might be great givers. Some of us might be great, um, have a prophetic gift. All these different gifts, each and every one of us are unique. No business judging anybody else for their gifts or for the lack of their gifts. You know, we need to just keep our hands off. But I would encourage you to pray, God, help me to develop my gifts. Give me the gift, you know, like the gift of healing. We talk about the gift of healing. I haven't, I've been a Christian for over 20 years. I haven't seen too many really remarkable healings. And I've prayed for a lot of people to heal, be healed. You know, I've, I've been told I've been given messages from God, been prophetic. I don't know if this is a prophetic message or not. I'm not going to stand up here and say, thus said the Lord, all this. I'm going to let you just take it, read your word with it, pray about it, and see if it hits home. I'm hoping it does. Because I've prayed about it and said, God, this is what I want to share. I hope this is what is needed here. So hopefully it's prophetic. Scripture says, desire that you might prophesy. And I've gone to conferences to learn how to prophesy. I've gone to where workshops where you go out into like a Best Buy and grab somebody. You know, hey, um, God's kind of put on my heart to just pray with you, to just encourage with you. And it's Major things have happened. I haven't done that in like 10 years, but I used to, we'd be sitting in the middle of Best Buy with people crying 
<laughs> you know, and it's like, what's going on here? You know, salespeople would be saying, what are you doing here anyways? You know, but it's, I haven't done that in a while. But I have been accused that, you know, even at church, like, what do you go around? Who'd you make cry today? <laughs> you know, because you just pray with somebody and, you know, it's like, and it even happens at work. I'm working in the hospital. It's like all of a sudden people come up and they just start crying. I don't know what it is, but I'm hoping it's the scent, that fragrance of Christ that might somehow be on me, that truly, you know, I'm, I'm praying this for everybody here that you'll recognize you're a gift of God. And, um, I think what happens, what worries me, what troubles me is a lot of people, they think, okay, I just accept Jesus and that's it. Well, you accept Jesus and you're saved. You have salvation. And it's so easy. It is so merciful. But there's so much more that he has for us. There are gifts, you know, the gift of tongues. You know, Paul says, don't do that. You know, that's what he says in Corinthians. He says, don't do that, Pete. He says, you know, don't do that unless you have somebody that's going to translate or something. I do speak in tongues, but on my private corner, that's, you know, and it's to build yourself up. I don't need that. The church I first went to, the Gospel Echoes Bible Church, they said, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. That put a lot of pressure on people to just almost, I don't know, I don't think it was healthy. But you don't need to speak in tongues to be saved. I don't believe that. I don't believe you need to fast to be saved. I don't believe you need to memorize scripture like I do to be saved. But I believe God gives us all these tools that we can grow closer to him and actually become more useful to him if we pursue him. Things like solitude, like getting away and spending some just extended times with God. Things like fasting. I would really encourage everybody here to seriously pray about fasting a little bit every week to get closer to God. I heard recently somebody says, if you diet, you look better. But if you fast, you'll see better. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. We need to grab a hold of that. And I, I think there's deeper places God wants to take all of us, not just the local, our church, every, the body of Christ corporately. And the reason we're not there is because we don't fast once in a while to honor God. Jesus said, when you fast, not if you fast. So... But above all this, all these gifts, whether, you know, small or large, the key thing, you know, as I said, like, Romans 12 talks about the gifts that are from God. Ephesians 4 talks about the gifts that are from Jesus. Like he says, I give some apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists. Jesus, if you look at the scripture, it says Jesus gave those. And in Corinthians, it talks about the things that the Spirit gives us, which are words of wisdom, words of knowledge, words of discernment, prophetic flow, and all that. And that's where he says, you know, speak in tongues, but don't do it like corporately in front of the church because it's not going to help. It's not going to edify anybody. Do it, you know, one-on-one. Do it with, you have somebody that can prophetically translate that. You know, give the, the translation of it. But in the middle of that, in that discourse of the Holy Spirit between 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 is the key to every gift in the Bible. It's 1 Corinthians 13. Now, many of you know it. Hopefully, all of you know that, that that's what's known as a love chapter. That's what's read at many, many weddings. And that's the last one I'll try to quote, and then we'll finish up here. And it goes something like this. Even though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm merely sounding brass, just a clanging symbol. And even though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding of all knowledge, and even though I can move mountains, have faith to move mountains, if I have not love, I am nothing. And even though I give all that I own to feed the poor, give all my money to, to the poor, give my body to be burned, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. See, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely, and it does not seek its own. And it believes all things, bears all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. You see, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is complete and perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away these childish things. For now we see through a glass dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know as I also am known. So now these three abide, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. 
Let all you do be done in love. Encourage the people around you in love. Help them out in love. Serve them out of love. John says God is love. And when his love flows through us, it makes it better. We live. And given, we have a living. We really do well. I have one minute left, according to this time here. <laughs> so I'm just going to pray right quick. Isaiah, you want to come up? You can lead in communion. Lord, I just thank you so much for the privilege of sharing your word. I thank you for the privilege of just having your word, God. And I pray that we all might just um, get into it deeper, Lord. I want to go deeper with you. I want to know you more. I want to reveal your love more. we got people that are hurting everywhere around us. We've got lives that are tattered and shattered like, a, like Buddy's little cloth there, Lord. And you can shine through them. You can heal them. You can restore them. You can refresh them. You can renew them, Lord. And God, I just pray that you give us hearts to give the gifts that you've given us. Help us to recognize that we have so much in our hands. You've given us so much. Help us to be quick to give out of love, Lord. And Lord, take us into deeper places. Help us to just push into like, to things like getting alone with you and into fasting and then just becoming more sensitive to your, your heart and your presence and your desire, your love for those around us. I thank you once again, Jesus, for this privilege. I ask for a blessing on, on the local, on this fellowship. I ask that they would impact all of Richmond with your love, for your glory, that their story might be your glory. In your precious name, Jesus.